it seems to me that every time we do another one of these episodes, we're that much closer to the start of the regular season. And oh yeah, that's because we are. Welcome back to another episode of the OHL podcast as the preseason is in full swing and the regular season now just over two weeks away. My name is Mike Farwell, Dan Mahar over there, and you can almost taste it at this point, Dansky, that regular season, a couple of weeks, and we're going to be having these little chit chats on Tuesdays and talking about what's been happening in the league during the regular season. It's going to be fun. It, it is. Yeah. I think uh, it's calm before the storm right now. You get this lull in the middle of preseason when players head off to NHL camps and the, the preseason game schedule lightens up for, for a few days and whatnot, but uh, pretty soon right back into the thick of it and the intensity is going to kick in. So we're going to spend this episode talking about something I think it would be fair to say is on the minds of every single OHL fan at least once during the season. And is it a little bit speculative? Sure. But is there a little bit of smoke behind the speculative fire, if I can put it that way? I'm going to say sure again as we dive into what we think we know about the finances in the Ontario Hockey League. But before we get there, Emails. We have emails. You know the email address, ohlpodcast at rogers.com. Clearly, you know it because you've been using it. So thank you for that. Let's dive right in to the email inbox. First one comes from Rob. Are you ready for this? Where is Chris Pope? Dan, over to you. I'll let you take that one. (laughs) In my basement in a in a cage. You can take that for what it's worth or not. It's up to you. Clearly, uh, Dan is not Chris Pope. Chris had been doing this podcast with me for uh, a little while, and he's just not doing the podcast with me anymore. It's pretty simple. You'll hear Chris Pope on our broadcasts again when Kitchener Rangers regular season starts up, but uh, Dan has graciously stepped forward. Long-time involvement in minor hockey. Even Ryan Payette of the London Free Press was chirping you and your coaching prowess on Twitter last week. Yeah, and you know, chirping the championship we just won largely thanks to the supreme development his young son received in our program. So, you know, yeah, you got to take it, I guess. You got to take it from the Knights reporter. Absolutely. The Knights reporter chirping the coach of his son's hockey team as you developed. I don't know how you did that. If you could develop Payette as a better sports writer, that would be fantastic. But anyway, Dan and I go back a long time. Uh, We've... I don't I couldn't count the number of junior hockey games we've attended together over the years. And as I said, Dan graciously stepped forward after Chris and I decided to stop doing the podcast together. So here we are. And to that point, it reminds me of a a message I got over Twitter from Lowell. And I didn't get into it because it didn't come to our email inbox. Again, OHL podcast at rogers.com. Use them, use that email address anytime. We'll respond good, bad, or otherwise, we're happy to hear some feedback from you. And Lowell was asking the same thing initially. Why isn't Chris there anymore? And then he wanted to know what's with the the shorter episodes. As you've probably noticed, we're giving you two episodes a week, Tuesdays and Fridays leading into the regular season. But when that regular season begins, we're going to go back to Friday feature length interviews because that's what Lowell said he liked. Those stories that we're getting from former players, coaches, managers, executives, you name it. And absolutely no intention of stopping that. But as we kind of warm up to the season, Dan and I talked about maybe bringing these episodes out twice a week and just warming ourselves up, warming you up a little bit and getting primed for the season. And if I'm going to be honest about this, zero idea what I'm doing. None whatsoever. I just thought the more content we can put out and the more conversations we can have, the more excited we're all going to be when the regular season rolls around. No, fair enough. And Lowell, I hear you. I'd rather hear those players and stories than me as well. But <laughs> but bear with us for for a few weeks till we till we kick off the season, and you'll get you'll get that. And and that's the other thing. And again, happy to hear your feedback. Uh, Dan on Twitter is at Tim Wallach, just like the former Expo. I'm at Farwell underscore OHL. Or again, I'll just drive home that email address: OHL Podcast at Rogers dot com. The theory behind this is we used to do one big long episode where there would be, you know, sort of an introduction that looked at the league that week and then went into the guest and the feature length interview. So the episodes were clocking in 
anywhere between an hour 20 and say two hours. So we thought, you know what we might do and see how it goes is separate those two pieces. So you're going to be hearing from Dan and I on Tuesdays talking about the week that was and the week that's coming up. And then on Fridays, you're going to get those feature length interviews. And again, it's kind of a shot in the dark here to see how it feels, see what you think about it. And we'll see where it goes based on the download numbers between Tuesday and Friday, or whether you email us at ohlpodcast at rogers.com and say, this sucks, put it all back in one episode. And, and we can do that too. But we thought this just might be a, a different way of tackling it. And it, I think it gives us, Dan, a little bit more freedom here too. I think so. And I hope the idea is, uh, like you said, over time to grow into it and start giving people what they want to hear through the feedback. And, and you know, if that feedback's get rid of this new clown, uh, wing it yourself, Farwell, all fair game. But uh, but we're here to hopefully bring you something that's worth listening to. Well, I will point out that after Rob's email, and by the way, you're going to get responses to every email you send. Uh, I got back to him, let him know. Chris isn't here anymore, but Dan was happy to step up and step in. Rob says he still loves the podcast. It's a weekly listen for him. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, if it's not yet a weekly listen for you, please make it one. Subscribe, like. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube now, that's awesome. If you're just listening on your favorite podcast app, don't forget you can see our clown faces and my complete and utter lack of hair uh, on our YouTube channel, which is also the OHL podcast. So look it up there, subscribe to that channel. As the season gets underway, you're going to be getting more and more content from all of these places. So please feel free. But I'm glad that Rob says still loves the podcast, happy to keep listening. And similar when we go to this email from Vince, can't say enough how much I enjoy your podcast. Vince, you're our kind of listener. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking me down off the ledge today, re Sam Dickinson. I was one of those cursing London, but I feel better now. Vince from St. Catharines. So there you go. Awesome. Thanks, Vince. That's great. Yeah. Be like Vince and, and Rob for that matter. Tune in. Like that's, we hope to talk more people down off the ledge and hopefully you'll talk us off the ledge, which I'm sure we'll be on at some point. There's no question because the season only has to have one or two instances where there's not enough transparency from the league for my liking or something like that is going wrong and we'll be hammering away and right on the verge of that ledge ourselves. So keep it coming. OHL podcast at rogers.com is the email address. Let's let's further Vince's point here for just a minute, because that's why we talked about the Sam Dickinson trade last week and if you missed the episode go back and get it because these episodes live on the internet forever just look up the ohl podcast and you'll find all of the previous episodes and if you're a subscriber you'll never miss one but in the in in the intervening days dan i found this really interesting so the, the london knights acquire sam dickinson from the niagara ice dogs because dickinson the ice dogs first rounder and fourth overall was not going to report so the ice dogs flip them to london for a pretty nice package of picks seven in total three seconds three thirds and a fifth and in return the niagara ice dogs also get a compensatory pick in next year's first round so they get two first rounders next it's pretty nice haul for niagara and obviously the london knights pay a steep price for the rights to sam dickinson who of course will report and play for the knights but then curiously not long after a few days later owen flores ends up being traded from london to niagara for a second rounder and a fifth. So ultimately, I guess this means Sam Dickinson was acquired for two seconds, three thirds, and Owen Flores. Yeah, and, and you'll find a lot of creativity in those trades when teams try to work out where the holes are in their lineup and how they can, uh, and you'll, you'll also find GMs who like to deal with specific other GMs. You'll see, you know, two, three trades between the same two, two folks, but, uh, but it does get interesting, um, and you have to believe some of these things were talked about well ahead of when they were announced publicly. I find it odd, because it's almost like doing one trade in two steps, isn't it? Which is what I find really strange about this. It is peculiar, and I again, going into the speculative uh, category here, you, ne you never know. I think London was pretty confident they were going to get uh, Brochu back between the pipes this year. Um, maybe it was just as far as making sure that another opportunity did not materialize before they pulled the trigger on that one. I'm guessing this was a deal that was probably agreed to uh, a fair bit earlier than they actually announced it, but that, a few uh, T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted before they could actually pull it. I, I received another message from Brian who had messaged the week prior because he was 
why does London get away with all this stuff? And we talked about that last week in the Dickinson episode. London's not getting away with anything. They paid really good value to get Sam Dickinson and the ice dogs get that compensation pick and all this different stuff. But Brian was back at me again this week. How is this happening? What's with London? Again, I think Dan makes a great point. Maybe just that safety net in case they weren't going to have Brett Brochu back, whatever the case may be. Even if you just look at it as it stands now, Sam Dickinson goes to London for two seconds, three thirds and Owen Flores. It's still a nice haul for Niagara and that compensation pick they get next year. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hefty price they paid. So, so as much as we want to be angry at London, I, I, I think you made the most salient point last time, Mike, where you said the, the team making out like bandits here are the ice dogs. I think so too. Okay. Before we get into this really fun money, 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 money talk in the Ontario hockey league, one more thing that struck me and I sent you a message about this, Dan. So we'll just get your thoughts quickly here on the pod, but Owen Outwater gets dealt from the North Bay battalion to the Kingston Frontenacs for a boatload of picks, a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. So five picks in exchange for Owen Outwater, who had all of 12 points in 64 games last year. So why so much value? Maybe because Outwater was a number one a year ago, 11th overall to North Bay in the OHL entry draft. But I I find it interesting that five picks Kingston is willing to pay for a guy that maybe didn't have the rookie season some thought he would have. Yeah. And, you know, it gives you a little insight in t- into the mindset of GMs as well. Cause I, I believe there's obviously some potential there uh, at water, still a young player and clearly had that pedigree to get himself picked that highly. Um, but the mindset piece, this is always intriguing to me when you hear the behind the scenes discussions of NHL GMs and, and trade discussions and whatnot, often that is a platform they'll use is player X was a first round pick. So I need something coming back that was a first or a high second or of similar value. And oftentimes it's not necessarily attached to his most recent performance or, or where he's declined or risen over time. They're fixated on draft slot where this player was drafted. And you can see a little bit of that in this trade as well. So, you know, this is a first round pick. Uh, we don't really care what he did last year. Uh, we're going to need something back. And part of that is selling it to their fans. You don't want to look like you you made a huge error. We picked the wrong guy. Now we're we're losing value here. So even to save face with the fans, they got to get something back of value there. But obviously, uh, you got Kingston thinking there's there's something to mine there, and there probably is. All right, I'm going to use this to to tease just a little bit about what we'll be talking about on Friday this week, and that is the development curve. Obviously, when you have a first rounder come to your team, you expect certain things and. And as Dan has pointed out, and we'll get into in more detail on Friday's episode, when you're drafting 15 slash 16-ish year old hockey players, it is notoriously difficult to determine exactly what that development is going to look like. So we'll talk more about that on Friday, but let's get into what we kind of started talking about when we ran into each other at a preseason game, Dan, and decided to bring to the podcast. And that is just the Ontario Hockey League in general. And and this was tied into our conversation from last week about the recovery that needs to happen from the pandemic and how much did this hurt teams financially and how much can team owners afford to be hurt financially in this league? How big a business is it really? So here are two things we know and we'll, we'll start the conversation here. Well, I guess one we know and one we're, pretty sure of. The thing that we know, as reported by Tony Saxon at GuelphToday.com last year when the Guelph Storm were sold, the sale price of the Storm was somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 to $15 million. That was about a year ago, as reported by Tony Saxon at GuelphToday.com, which I will also add was a number that surprised me a little bit. I didn't think these teams were going north of $10 million at this point, but that's what Tony reported. 13 to 15 mil was the asking price or the sale price of the Guelph Storm a year ago. Fast forward to this year, and we know that there's new ownership, of course, in Niagara, the Ice Dogs. Now, the Brantford Expositor reports that the rumored sale price, so we don't have anything quite as close to confirmation as Tony Saxon reported, but the rumored sale price of the Ice Dogs was somewhere between 16 and 20 million dollars. So call it three to five more than what the Storm apparently went for a year ago. I don't know about you, Dan, but as I said, 
These kinds of numbers surprise me a wee bit. They surprise me a fair bit. And I'm just, uh, I know things have changed. There's a lot different about the economy now than there was previously. But I, I remember hearing some speculation approximately 10 years ago when there were some whispers that maybe maybe the hunters would consider selling the knights. And the figure of 12 million was tossed around at the time, about 10 years ago. And there were some, some suggestions that that was approximately three times the value of some other OHL franchises. So if you're starting to get the Guelph Storms and Niagara Ice Dogs going for what you're talking, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 million in that range, you can imagine how the Knights may have uh, increased in value or some of these other franchises. And I think the um, the point you made, Mike, about how close to the vest some of these teams play their cards in terms of the finances, there's got to be some reason for that. Uh, we talk about open books and, and you can do some rudimentary numbers around, you know, season ticket numbers or average attendance, average ticket prices, and start to figure out some of the, the revenues. Sure. But there's also some secrecy around what these franchises are actually worth. We don't know a lot about sponsorships. We don't know a lot about arena deals. We don't know a lot about any of these kinds of things. Clearly, I would say, Mike, what these prices tell us is that there's some room in those budgets, uh, especially for teams that are creative and uh, financially savvy or maybe have some bigger backing than we think from the ownership level. But uh, there's a whole lot of variables at play. And, and those numbers tell me that they might be making a little more than, than we think, which is probably a good thing for the health of the league. I have heard, and it ties into what you talked about when we had our coaching conversation a couple of weeks ago with Derek Laxdahl being lured from the National Hockey League, where he was an assistant with Dallas, to now coach in the Ontario Hockey League with the Oshawa Generals. It tells you something about the health of the league and the health of the franchise, quite frankly, in Oshawa, to be able to pay whatever it is. I'm sure he's not commanding the same NHL salary, but we get it. It, it, it suggests that there is a level of health in the league. To your point on bums and seats, I I remember hearing not too long ago, and I think the magic number is somewhere in the 3,000 range. If you're getting 3,000 fans on average to a game, you're doing pretty well when it comes to the money that you have invested in the team. But let's talk about that just a little bit further, because here's what I think, Dan. Obviously, if you're spending, let's call it approximately $15 million to buy a junior hockey team, you are not someone who's having garage sales on the weekend, right? You've got some money. You've got some financial wherewithal. And I would suspect, I hear all kinds of things, and I'm not going to claim to be an expert in business, but I hear all kinds of things about, you know, write-offs and, and loss leaders and things like that. But I, I don't know that I'm going to be like, how much money would you have to have to say, I'm spending $15 million on something that I don't expect to get a return on? I think that would have to be a lot of money. And I'm not sure the people buying the franchises for about 15 million bucks have that kind of money. So it's a long way around of saying, I, I think there has to be profit to be made here. There has, you're not going to spend that kind of money on a franchise without some expectation of making it back or something back. Oh, absolutely. You have to, you have to think it's at least in the ballpark of, of breaking even. And I know that pandemic and other factors there are limiting factors on, on the amount of money you can charge for tickets these days so there are limiting factors where these franchises might not be able to blow the roof off uh, in terms of the black ink but there has to be money to be made there and yet you hear these tales over time of, of lower level competitive sports uh, baseball leagues etc where some of these owners come in and there's just such a competitive fire there that they they can take a bit of a loss on this property in their portfolio if you will they might have a business or some other interests that are making a lot of money and they they don't really need to break even here and you, you get a bit of that from around around north america i don't get the sense that that's what's happening here mike like you described you're seeing a few consortiums so maybe not one big backer that has 15 million maybe you know they're piecing it together from a few interests but in my ex my limited uh, financial experience you you don't get consortiums together unless you can promise them something and and it's not just brand recognition or a good name that they're after. There's there's profit. And if you're having five or six of these business savvy people coming on board, it's because they've seen the books. They've seen the potential. They've seen the sponsorships. They've seen some of these other things that you've described. And they, they know that they can make some money out of this. Now, we have, of course, the now famous examples in the Ontario Hockey League of 
the late Eugene Melnick, who absolutely bled money for Mississauga, but went into it knowing that he would. And quite frankly, Mr. Melnick had plenty of money to burn. It was not a, a burden financially for him, but he never made a nickel as far as we can tell and just kept writing checks and even essentially bought the Mississauga franchise an opportunity to play in the Memorial Cup back in 2011. Like he, he wrote the big check to make sure that they could host and, and that was that. But to this day, Elliot Kerr, by all indications, is is in relatively the same boat. I mean, he's a gamer. He's trying to make it go. And then you look north of the 401 and Scott Abbott of Trivial Pursuit fame took a hard hit for about a decade with the Brampton Battalion before saying, you know what, enough is enough. If I'm going to lose money, I'm going to do it back in my hometown. And up to North Bay, the battalion went. Yeah, and you know, it's 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 why I'm very hesitant and careful to suggest that, you know, they're all making money hand over fist, they're lying to us, they've got all this wealth, because clearly that's not the case. And those two examples you just cite, cited, I think, lend credibility to that 3,000 number you're talking about. What what did those franchises have in common? They didn't hit that 3,000 number. And I think the ones that you look at and say, oh, how do they get by? How do they make it? You know, the Peterboroughs and some of these smaller communities with not the, the luxurious ranks, they managed to keep it above that high watermark of, of 3000 fans. And then the ones that do significantly better than that seem to be flourishing. So there is obviously a balance to be played here. You look at some of these towns just don't have the corporate sponsorship and backing. I, for the life of me, will never understand why GTA based franchises can't make a go of it with the wealth there and the sponsorship opportunities there and the hockey backgrounds and history in those areas. But uh, there's obviously a balance there, and and I would love to see the behind the scenes on on these teams because some seem to be nicking off like bandits, and others are really walking a, a tightrope. I suppose we should point out here: I don't think there is any obligation on the part of owners of OHL franchises, and frankly, I'm not sure there should be an obligation on their part to disclose what they make in terms of revenue or profit annually there's there's nothing that says the books have to be open it's just there are a lot of questions from fans that are passionate about this league as to how it all kind of works and we just have a few guideposts to go from here sale prices of late being one of them yeah absolutely and that and that's that's a tricky thing because when you spend enough time around the boards like you and i both do mike you hear lots of feedback from the fans and one of the most common ones you hear is a little bit of grumpiness around you know this team is so cheap why don't they shell out for a new score clock or a new better dressing room facilities to keep up with the Joneses or what, what, what have you. I, I think that is a key factor that you're talking about there is that no one really knows. No one understands. No one has seen the books. People speculate and they hear things. And a lot of what you hear around the hockey ranks, shockingly, Mike, is not true. <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's, it's really hard to know that, but you're, you're right. They don't have any obligation to disclose to us. They, some franchises like Kitchener is unique where you're community owned and you do have some oblig obligation to uh, report through the board and whatnot, but uh, there's still, I'm sure all kinds of things we don't know about that franchise. And, and none of these owners have any obligation to you other than the contract they have with you as a fan, which is here's what I'm going to ask you for to sit in the seat to watch a hockey game. I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I'm, I think it's a pretty sturdy limb to say that, I don't think anybody's going to be investing the kind of money that they appear to be investing in Ontario Hockey League teams with the idea that they're not going to make anything in return. I just don't think they would spend upwards of $15 million to, to buy a franchise in a hockey league and not expect to make something back on it. No, I, I definitely agree. And for, for a little era there, we had, a, we had a number of these former NHLers coming into the game because it was how they came through. And some of them had had kids playing in the league and so speculation was well, this just a great way for them to get opportunities for their kids to play in the best league and they're not worried about uh, making money and whatnot but I, I i do i do think that no matter how you slice it at the end of the day there's money to be made there and they know it or at least opportunity to make money and maybe they just have enough confidence or ego or what whatever you want to call it to feel that they can coax some profit out of that situation Okay, it would be impossible to have a conversation about money and finances in the Ontario Hockey League without addressing what might be described as the elephant in the room. I don't know. This is this is amateur sport. The players are not paid other than their stipend, 
You get a little bit more when you're an overager. Of late, there's some money in there for cell phone service and personal training and things like that. And of course, let's never forget the education package, which I think is worth its weight in gold, but we'll just park all of that. This is not a professional league in terms of you've got a salary cap and you've got players making this much or that much. However, we have had instances and you know, a couple of them not too far in the past in both Niagara and Windsor, where the franchises ran into some trouble because they were providing financial perks to players, be it vehicles or cash or whatever the case may have been. These stories have come out and the teams have been punished for it. We even had a previous guest on this podcast point to the Bobby Ryan arrival in Owen Sound as one that raised a lot of eyebrows around the league because apparently he was supposed to end up in Saginaw. I don't know. I'm going by what the guest who was a part of that Saginaw organization told us on the podcast. So even Owen Sound in that context might have been involved in something that lured a player to their market. I don't think it would be out of line to suggest, Dan, that if we have seen teams punished and sanctioned by the league for running afoul of financial rules and regulations, I don't think it would be unfair to suggest that others may have done it too and just haven't been caught by the league doing it. Thoughts? Yeah, I've heard that quite a few times where... The difference between those teams and every other team is those were the ones that were dumb enough to get caught. And that's kind of a crude way of phrasing it. But the one thing you see these people in front of the cameras, the GMs, the owners, they're all perfect gentlemen and women in front of the cameras and have plenty of decorum, but make no mistake about it. The recruiting piece behind the scenes is vicious. It is over the top. It is back and forth. If you talk to any parent that's had a kid ranked highly for the draft or even ranked in the middle of the draft, you'd ask them about the phone calls they get from various agents, the GMs. The, it's it's a complete game year round with thousands of phone calls, little offers, little tidbits, checking in here and there. It's, it's a vicious game. So it's not a big leap to think that the team that really wants to come out and top there, they put a lot of effort into recruiting a certain kid or wooing them to their, to their city would maybe push a little further and make a different kind of offer, something to put them over the top. Cause they really want to win that competition to get that kid and win that competition on the ice. So I don't think anything we're talking about here is a huge leap to suggest this stuff's going on. I think those examples you gave of teams being caught just show that it, it, it happens. It's just a matter of how it happens, but the elephant is there. Yeah, and it it ties into what we were saying earlier, where an an owner or an ownership consortium has no obligation whatsoever to share with us the financial particulars of their organization. And in this case, look, nobody here is trying to say that there's a dark cloud hanging over major junior hockey in this context. We'll leave the Hockey Canada stuff aside. We know what that dark cloud was all about. And it's very evident what that dark cloud was all about. But in this particular context, when we're talking about money and how it may be used in the league, again, we have documented cases. And you mentioned one, Dan, with Portland in the WHL as well. Yes. Yeah, Portland got dinged, I believe, the heaviest penalty of any junior hockey franchise for for some of the shenanigans they were pulling to lure players out west. And I believe Seth Jones was the key player involved in that scandal. So there was some big names you're dealing with, and they can put the franchise over the top. And Portland was extremely competitive during that window. Just check the record when, when he was there. So it can really pay off because if you get four rounds of playoffs, three or four rounds of playoffs, and potentially a Memorial Cup berth, watch the sponsorships roll in, you might be talking about making a play for a player like that, where there's some under the table money exchanged or whatnot pays off tenfold for the team over time. So gain in season ticket holders, you name it. So these are calculated risks. I believe some of these teams are taking. Um, They obviously now have some systems. They've gotten smarter and some systems to keep them under wraps, whether we're talking NDAs or what it might, whatever it might be, but uh, you know, what's going on. uh, And it's just a matter of how quickly the law, I guess, catches up to the, the scoff laws. I want to be a purist in this regard, if I can. And you can call me naive and you can call me uh, 
you know, a, a, a mouthpiece for the league if you want. But again, I, I don't want to paint this in any way as being some sort of massive dark cloud. I'm just, again, looking at what we know and the sanctions that have been handed down to date, obviously things have happened and things have come out that they happened and, and leagues have responded accordingly. So yes, does it lead me to believe that there are probably more instances that we haven't heard about? Of course, I'm not that naive. However, the purest in me is gonna say this because I don't think your point is, is a bad one, Dan, in that the number of playoff rounds, maybe setting up a team for the next few years sort of thing with the reputation it builds. But my, the purest in me wants to say, it comes back to kind of what we talked about with franchise owners. They're not going to spend 15 million bucks to lose money year over year. They're not going to do whatever they can to get player A, B, or C unless they want to win. It's all, I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? It's a results oriented business. You are measured on wins and losses. These owners, these groups, these teams, they all want to win. And that's the bottom line that people should keep their eye on the ball with as well, is that you want your franchise to want to win. The fact that they're trying to compete on this level and doesn't matter what city you're in, you're trying to do it is, is the important factor. And, and you keep hearing people say things, well, why doesn't the league step in? Why doesn't the league punish city X or city Y? Well, look at it from the big picture. This to the, and their, from their perspective, it's almost like consider like a, a big factory is looking to set up shops somewhere. And you have various cities bidding for that, those services and trying to do the sales pitch to the company. I'll come here for this reason or that reason. At the end of the day, the league stepping back and saying, you know, as long as they set up in our province, we're happy. It's going to go to one of these cities. We're happy that that economy is being bolstered regardless of where it goes. And that's the way they look at these players. Let these teams fight for them. Let, let them claw and, and draw whatever they can to the, as long as it stays in our overall jurisdiction. So so the league's not necessarily out there looking to to throw anyone in the slammer. Uh, but at the same time, there's a line there and we're hoping no one crosses it too far, which we've seen in a couple of cases. Okay. Just before we wrap up this episode, I've got a $15 million question for you. Okay. All right. You have $15 million in the bank. Are you spending it on an Ontario Hockey League franchise? Do you, Dan Mahar, want to become an OHL owner? Then I'd want to see the books, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. I, I, I'm not sure it's the, the surest pathway to doubling your money. Let's put it that way. So I'm, I'm thinking you'd have to have significantly more than the 15 million in the bank to do it. And you'd also have to have a strong background with the league and in hockey. And it's, it's just your thing. Boy, you, you are a lot softer than I thought you would be. I'm right there. If it's my last 15 million, it's going into the league. Are you kidding me? I would be the loudest, most abrasive and obnoxious owner the league has ever seen. And I would rub it in your face every chance I got. I'm in. So next franchise that comes up for sale, uh, I, I'll keep playing the lot of 649 until my 15 mil comes in. I'm buying into this league in a heartbeat. It would be so much fun to be an owner. Hey, I, re I respect that. I mean, and, I, and just when you come to me looking for uh, canned goods and whatnot after, don't, no, but I'm with you. I hear you like that. You go be that obnoxious brash owner and like that attention. What do they say? No, no attention's bad attention. Exactly. So no there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We started this episode uh, by reading your emails, which was awesome. I, I suspect just as we were having this conversation, Dan, there might be more emails coming in. But if David Branch sends one of those emails, you're going to get my out of office reply, Mr. Commissioner. A little busy to respond to that one. Listen, we're just talking about what all the fans are talking about and piecing together some stories based on what we already know. That email address, by the way, is ohlpodcast at rogers.com. Use it anytime. Follow Dan on Twitter at Tim Wallach, just like the former Montreal Expo. I'm on Twitter at Farwell underscore OHL. And remember that this is the OHL podcast. Please subscribe, like, give us a review, tell a friend about it. We're just we're just starting the build from here right into the regular season and beyond. So stay with us for another season on the OHL podcast.